So let's pray, and then we can get into the Word. Father, thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you for bringing us here and uh, bringing us to the place where we can worship you, standing on the grace that you've given us through Christ, not on our own merit, but through Christ we come before you and we're able to speak directly to you and uh, enjoy your presence. We pray that you are with us as we study the word this morning, Lord. Speak to us, speak through your word straight to our hearts and our minds and guide us in our lives. Give us your wisdom this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, if you want to open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. The title for our study is Fear of God, Wisdom of Others. Fear of God, Wisdom of Others. Proverbs 15. Most of us are pretty familiar with the two greatest commandments to love God and love others, right? The challenge of these commandments, as we all know, is figuring out how to live them in our daily lives. Easier said than done. All of scripture fits within these two instructions of God, to love God and love others. But luckily, we're in the book of Proverbs, which focuses on teaching us how to live out God's instructions in our daily lives. Now, in place of the word love, Proverbs often uses terms like wisdom or fear of God, fear of the Lord. So this morning, we received some helpful instruction on how to live out the love of God through the fear of God and how to live out the love of others through wisdom, trading wisdom with others, giving wisdom to others and receiving wisdom from others. So fear of God and wisdom of others. Now we'll start in verses one through seven focusing on wise words and how powerful those wise words could be. We're going to start in verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouth of fools pours forth foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. A fool despises his father's instruction, but he who receives correction is prudent. In the house of the righteous there is much treasure, but in the revenue of the wicked is trouble. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the fool does not do so. So a gentle response de-escalates conflict. When we're faced with conflict with someone else or conflict between other people, a gentle response de-escalates that conflict. It calms anger in ourselves when we respond gently. It calms anger in others as well. But harsh words, even if those words are technically true, Well, I'm just saying the truth. Even if those words are technically true, harsh words encourage anger and conflict. Nobody wants to get beaten over the head with the truth. So even if we're right, harsh words encourage anger and conflict. Now, a gentle response isn't weakness, which one might consider it to be like avoiding the problem in, in a form of weakness. A gentle response isn't that. A gentle response is strength, by overcoming the conflict or overcoming the problem, that you're not letting the problem affect you to the point that it controls your emotions, but you are gently dealing with the problem. Now, those who are wise have knowledge, but they also know how to use that knowledge that they have. They know what to say. They know how to say it. And they only share the knowledge that others are ready to hear. In contrast, fools pour out all their 
foolish thoughts and all their foolish opinions and and just keep saying it and saying it no matter what the other person is dealing with or how the other person is taking it or what the other person is thinking. Uh, those who are wise have their knowledge <clears throat> and they distribute that knowledge wisely and in small portions, the portion that other people can be able to understand and take in. Fools just dump out their opinions all over the place. That being said, the wise desire to share their knowledge and their wisdom freely with others. So even though it's measured, the wise and how they distribute their knowledge wisely, they still are trying or attempting or, or their, their goal is to freely share that knowledge as much as others can handle. Fools, on the other, on the other hand, hold back from helping others. Now, they're they're barfing up all their opinions and thoughts, but they're, those, the goals of those opinions and thoughts aren't necessarily to help someone. They're for whatever other foolish desire that they have. Sometimes uh, they're holding back from helping others out of anger, that they're, they, they have anger toward the other person and they don't want that other person to get help or some sort of jealousy type thing that they don't want the other person to be helped. Sometimes it's just a hesitance. And I think a lot of us could relate to this, just feeling like shy or uh, or like feeling like we're not in a position to help someone or something. And, and so fools will hold back their, uh, their, their knowledge that could help someone for a variety of reasons. Well, in this way, speaking wisely actually brings life and inspiration to ourselves and others. As we speak, we can inspire even ourselves accidentally, but inspire others as well. Foolish speech, on the other hand, tears down others, discourages others, which is almost a really good test of how wise our words are. When we speak to someone else, are they lifted up and encouraged by what we're saying? Even if we're saying something that's difficult to hear, they could still be, if it's, if it's a wise word, they can still be lifted up by that difficult thing. Or is what we're saying discouraging them and putting them down? Are they feeling less in, less like ready to go after we talk to them. And now this wisdom of speech begins with wisdom of listening. Our wisdom of speech begins with wisdom of listening, following the instructions and corrections of the Lord. These instructions that we get from God are the Lord speaking to us through scripture, the Lord speaking to us through wise counselors that are um, empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Now, those who follow the teaching of the Lord receive the benefit of that teaching to their life. And as we listen and we speak, the Lord is always watching to help guide us and correct us along the way. So the wise consider their voice to be a powerful tool of influence that they utilize with great care. The wise consider their voice to be a powerful tool of to be utilized with great care. When I was in Spain a couple weeks ago, uh, a lot of people that we ran into didn't speak English um, or very much English at all. So a lot of situations that we were in, I had to speak with whatever limited Spanish I had to communicate. And uh, what I experienced doing this is I had whatever thought I had in my head that I was trying to get out, whatever idea I had that I was trying to get out to them, I had to distill that idea down to words that I knew in Spanish <laughs> in order to communicate that idea. And so it's like I wanted to say all this grand stuff, but I ended up only saying this little sentence that I could put together in Spanish. And not only that, but I had to worry about like whatever question I'm going to ask this person, I got to be able to understand their answer. So I have to I have to give a question that I'll actually understand the answer coming back to me. So every single word that I would that what I would say was very, you know, crafted and thought through really carefully to make sure I knew the word for it and make sure the other person was going to be able to respond with something that I'd understand afterwards and I had very levels of success with this. Sometimes they laughed at me, but but I cared for every single word and every single sentence. When you have to watch every word that you say, like I was doing, you end up only saying extremely meaningful things. Everything I said was exactly like to the point. What what needed to be said and what I needed to know, exactly that thing. 
or something else that sounded like that thing in Spanish with my, sometimes I'd say stuff and they'd be like, what are you talking about? And I'd know it was right. And it was just because my accent was so bad. They didn't understand what I was saying. But when we're speaking English, it shouldn't be much different. There's power in our words for wisdom and there's power in our words for foolishness. We can solve conflict with our words or we can create conflict with our words. We can heal others with our words or we can hurt others with our words. We can inspire others to grow with our words or we can hold them down with our words. And the first step of using this tool that we have, our words, the first step is correctly, is, is listening and learning from the Lord. Hearing from God, learning from him how he communicates to us and how we can communicate to others. And learning that wisdom and that knowledge from the Lord and then communicating, using that tool of our, of our words to communicate very specifically and, and, and uh, wisely in a way that really benefits those around us. So this, these first seven verses is focused on these, these wise words that we have and how powerful they can be to others. Verses 8 through 11 are focused on fearing God, specifically in a sacrificial way. So we can read verse 8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. The way of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but he loves him who follows righteousness. Harsh discipline is for him who forsakes the way, and he who hates correction will die. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. So how much more the hearts of the sons of men. Now our first exposure in the Bible to wicked sacrifice is in Genesis chapter 4 with Adam and Eve's first two kids. Cain and Abel. Abel brings a faithful sacrifice to God, and his older brother Cain brings an unfaithful sacrifice. Now, when Cain's sacrifice is shot down by the Lord, is not accepted by the Lord, Cain's angry that his brother's sacrifice was accepted and his was not. But God, God doesn't just spite him right there for being angry or for bringing the wrong sacrifice. There's no bolt of lightning that comes down and just strikes Cain. Instead, God says, don't be angry, Cain. There's nothing to be angry about. Just follow my instructions. Just give a faithful sacrifice, and I will accept that sacrifice from you. Don't be angry. Just give a faithful sacrifice to me. Now, our passage here describes the sacrifice and the worship of the wicked, as an abomination to God. Wicked sacrifice, or the sacrifice of the wicked as an abomination. What we give the Lord, or what we do for the Lord in vain, it doesn't fool him. We can't trick him by doing things for him or giving things to him in vain. A sacrifice isn't truly a sacrifice if our heart isn't reflecting the action that we're doing. If we're just an empty shell doing that action. And we can serve the Lord. We can give to the Lord. We can pray to the Lord. We can be spiritual in the name of the Lord and gain nothing if we're double-minded in those actions. If our heart is split. If our heart's in one place and our actions is in another. But God delights in the prayer and sacrifice of those who are actually following him. He considers the sacrifice of those who are wicked or those who are, just remember wickedness is just anything apart from God or going against God. He considers the sacrifice of those who are wicked, he considers that an abomination. And on the complete opposite side of the spectrum, he considers it a delight when we're actually following him and give him that sacrifice. When both our hearts and our actions are in line with God's instructions for us. Now, God disciplines those he loves when they fall away from him, just as a good parent disciplines children that go astray. If we respond to God's discipline positively, then we can be restored. That if we ignore God's discipline, ignore God's correction, in other words, 
it's going to destroy our lives, and it'll be our, our own undoing. Now, being a Christian, being a follower of Christ, by definition, is presenting our bodies as living sacrifices to God. Our lives, what we live, is a living sacrifice to the Lord. That means that the way we daily live is an act of worship. Our daily actions, our everyday living, is an act of worship in itself. Which is why our whole hearts and our whole lives are Christ's to direct. Because everything we do is an act of sacrifice and worship to the Lord. Now through much of the world and through much of the last 2,000 years... To say that you're a Christian is to commit your life and often commit your family's life to Christ at the risk of real suffering and at the risk of death on that claim. Now, we have a blessing in the United States with our freedom and potentially a crutch in the United States with our freedom in the way that we are actually incentivized, not just allowed, but we're incentivized by the blessing that we have, to call ourselves Christians, but then live however we want, however we desire. Live in whatever way we want to, but call ourselves whatever we want to call ourselves. Living to self-prosper, living to build ourselves up, or living for whatever we desire, not living to humbly serve and humbly sacrifice the Lord. Now, it should be scary to us to call ourselves by Christ's name, but hold back parts of our lives just for ourselves. To call ourselves Christians, but then hold back something that's just for me, that's for my own uh, benefit. To do that is to give an unfaithful offering to the Lord, just as Cain did. If our bodies are living sacrifice, that becomes, our lives become an unfaithful sacrifice. Now, God will correct us from this, just as he corrected Cain, but our response to that correction is up to us. If we, res- if we respond by striving to give more of our lives to God, that sacrifice will be accepted, just as God said to Cain, that if you give me a faithful sacrifice, I'll accept that sacrifice. So just because the Lord's correcting us isn't a bad thing, it's a good thing. It's an opportunity for us to further give our lives to the Lord. And there's so much grace that you know we, we're not needing to be perfect before God or accepts our sacrifice. But us striving to give more and more of our lives to the Lord, that in and of itself is a faithful sacrifice. But if we respond by continuing to hold back, if God points out in our lives, and like maybe he's doing this morning, an area of our lives that we're holding back from him, if he's pointing that out and we continue to hold back, God tells Cain in Genesis 4 that sin will rule over us. If we continue to give that unfaithful sacrifice of our lives, that sin will control us and rule over us. So fearing God is sacrificial. In verses 12 through 17, fearing God is also joyful. Read in verse 12. A scoffer does not love one who corrects him, nor will he go to the wise. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. The heart of him who has understanding seeks knowledge, But the mouth of fools feeds on foolishness. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he who is of a merry heart has a continual feast. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a fatted calf with hatred. Now, fools don't like to be corrected. In fact, fools typically despise people who try to correct them. The wise not only appreciate correction and being corrected, they actually seek out correction through wise counsel. The wise seek to find wise people 
wise in the Lord people in their lives who can correct them on a regular basis and, and help provide feedback. Wisdom hungers for more wisdom. So wisdom goes and seeks it out. Foolishness has an appetite for more foolishness. So it blocks out the wisdom. Now it's interesting that this passage speaks highly of those who are merry and those who are cheerful. It seems just as our wisdom brings more wisdom, when we have wisdom, it encourages, it has an appetite for more wisdom. In the same way, joy brings us more joy. Our joy has an appetite for more joy. This joy being the result of wisdom and righteousness itself. Now this isn't advocating for a false happiness. It's not advocating for us to put on a show to impress others with how joyful we seem to them. This is encouraging us to focus on our hope in the Lord. That's what this is encouraging us to do. When we dwell in an unhealthy way on our troubles, we break ourselves down. When we're focused on the hardship, focused on the affliction that we have, we're breaking our own spirit down. When we're focused on the hope that we have in the Lord, we're building ourselves up in a true, real joy. So how do we find this real joy and this real hope in God? Now, it might shock you to hear this because it's only been said a billion times in the book of Proverbs before, but the answer to that question is by fearing the Lord. We find the joy and the hope in God by fearing the Lord. Remember, the fear of the Lord is the start of our path to wisdom. This was like one of the first things that the book of Proverbs said in, in chapter 1 was, to start on this path of learning wisdom, you must fear the Lord to begin that path. But it also said that fear of the Lord is the destination of that path. It's almost circular in a way. You have to fear the Lord to begin to learn wisdom, but what wisdom is pointing you to is a fear of the Lord in the end. So you grow in that fear of the Lord as well. Fear of the Lord being that awe and that respect that we have for God that drives us to follow him with everything. We're so in awe of the Lord. We, we so respect the Lord that we know all we want to do is follow him and seek after him. We can find joy and hope and peace in any situation from the perspective of fearing the Lord. What do we have to lose when we have everything in God for eternity? when we are dead set on fearing the Lord, when that is our focus, we have nothing to lose. And our, and our pain and our hardship isn't quite the same. And we experience it. You know, we, we weep when it's appropriate to weep. We have afflictions that are real. But we have joy through them because our focus is on what we have in the Lord for eternity. Our trust is in what we have in God. Our awe and our respect for God is so strong that the joy persists, persists through that pain. But without this understanding of God, nothing will ever be enough for us. Without the understanding of fear of the Lord, forget trying to have joy in the bad times. We won't even have joy in the good times without the fear of the Lord because nothing will be enough. As we fear the Lord, we seek his correction and we have a real joy in the toughest times. In fact, we can connect every joyless or hopeless moment in our lives to a lack of fear of the Lord. Morgan and I have a joke each week <laughs> that uh, we can't trust my feelings about something until Wednesday of each week. So... The reason is, is I spend, I spend the weekend, you know, preparing for Sunday and Sunday I give it my all, you know, and I'm just exhausted after Sunday, just wiped out. So Monday I'm always tired and I'm always just like beat and, and, you know, I'm working too. So like I'm getting through my work day and I'm just tired and, and whatever. So Morgan and I are constantly talking about things in life all the time and I'll, I'll just be just slightly less optimistic on Mondays than normal. You know, I'll be slightly, a slightly less joyful outlook on things on Monday. And we just say, 
Now let's just wait till Wednesday to talk about that. <laughs> Because by Wednesday, I'm rested, I'm refreshed, I'm excited, I'm like, let's go, let's do this, you know, I got the, the, the world is my oyster, I can, I can do anything, right? Um, but Monday, not so much, Monday I'm a little bit more, <laughs> more tired and down. Now, me being discouraged, or more discouraged on Mondays, it's not a, it's not a total depression, it's just, it's just like the, the world isn't quite as uh, bright on Mondays. So me being more discouraged on Mondays may, may be a symptom of me not trusting and fearing the Lord enough on those days. When I'm tired, me not fearing the Lord in that moment. You know, our, our challenges, uh, things that discourage us, our long to-do lists, all of that may be daunting to us. But we're not judged by how we perform relative to our own expectations of ourselves. That's not what determines success. We're not judged by the outcomes of what we're trying to accomplish, whether things work out the way we wanted them to or not. We're judged by how we follow what God is calling us to do each day, each moment. We're judged by, by what he's calling us to, not what we're calling ourselves to or what we expect to happen. And God equips us for that calling that he gives us. He cares for us through that calling. God provides for us through that calling. All that's left is the joy and the hope from trusting him to do so. Trusting him in that calling. Trusting him to provide for us, to care for us, to equip us. That's all that's left to do. And in that way, even in a day like Monday, you know, I could be encouraged in the Lord and, and not so not so discouraged, even when I'm tired. All right, now I put myself in a bad spot for tomorrow, but <laughs> it's a holiday, right? Uh, just enjoy the holiday. So fearing the God fearing God is joyful. Now verses eighteen through thirty three, wise interactions with others are valuable. Let's read verse eighteen. A wrathful man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger allays contention. The way of the lazy man is like a hedge of thorns, but the way of the upright is a highway. A wise son makes a father glad, but a foolish man despises his mother. Folly is joy to him who is destitute of discernment, but a man of understanding walks uprightly. Without counsel plans to, without counsel, plans go array, but in the multitude of counselors they are established. A man has joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. The way of life winds upward for the wise, that he may turn away from hell below. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the boundary of the widow. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant. He who is greedy for gain troubles his own house, but he who hates bribes will live. The heart of the righteous studies how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours forth evil. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. The light of the eyes rejoices the heart, and a good report makes the bones healthy. The ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. He who disdains instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebuke gets understanding. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Now, our ability to control our own anger affects the emotions of those around us. The wise are full of patience and peace with others and love for others. And that helps us reconcile with our enemies, with people we have conflict with. When, we're, when we control our anger and we approach the situation with a patience for the person that we'd normally be angry with, with peace for them, instead of 
trying to create conflict with them or trying to show them what they did is wrong. When we have love for them, when we're caring more about how this situation is affecting them than we're caring about how it's affecting us, that helps us reconcile with those people we have conflict with. Now, the wise might be slow to anger, but the wise are quick to accomplish through diligence. Patience shouldn't be confused with laziness. So we can be patient with other people and patient with situations. It's different from laziness. Patience is waiting to act, waiting for the right time to act. Laziness is something that's actually immoral because laziness is failing to act when we are supposed to act. So the wise are slow to anger, patient, waiting for the right moment, but they're quick to accomplish, that they're not lazy, that they're acting when it's the right time to act. The wise take great care with their words, and even God listens to the wise speak and the wise pray to him because of the care that they take with their words. Fools spew foolishness from their mouths, and through that foolishness, they distance themselves from God. As Proverbs has shared with us before, wisdom and foolishness have natural and supernatural results. Now, life naturally goes wrong for the fool. The things the fool chooses to do come back to hurt them in the end. But in addition to that, God adds additional judgment or correction for the fool to help change their mind or turn them towards wisdom. Pride, greed, and unfairness are motivated by this like self-improvement type focus that I want to get ahead, so I need to keep everything for myself. Or I need to get ahead, so I need to uh, get the better of someone or, or be unfair to them, get, get more for myself than what they have. Or I need to think more highly of myself because I need to get ahead. This, it's all motivated by this self-improvement focus. But in the end, it actually hurts us more. Pride, greed, selfishness, unfairness hurts us more than helps us. Foolishness seems more enjoyable to fools, but as they choose that foolish path, things just never seem to quite work out. And it just never seems to be their fault. But they choose foolishness and things just keep going wrong for them somehow. The wise seek a deeper understanding of life than that. The wise utilize wise counselors to help give them perspectives that they don't already see. In fact, fools only listen to themselves. They like to hear themselves talk and they like what they're saying. And they believe what they're saying. But the wise hear the wisdom of others and use that wisdom that other people are giving them to help see things that they can't see themselves. The wise recognize that other people around them have wisdom and value to share with them that they're not currently seeing. Now, it's obvious that we can be encouraged by other people who are trying to encourage us, who are saying encouraging words to us and saying things that would build us up. But we should also be encouraged by those who correct us or rebuke us or tell us that we're wrong. We should be encouraged by both the people who are saying nice things and pleasant things and the people who are correcting us and rebuking us because each of those situations is an opportunity to learn. When we receive those kind, encouraging words from others, it obviously shows us things that we're doing right and things that uh, people appreciate about us. When we receive the correction or the rebuke, even if it's not 100% correct correction or rebuke, that gives us insight into uh, how we can grow, into areas that we can become better. So we should think of both of those things as encouragement. When someone comes up to you and tells you what you're doing wrong, you should be encouraged by that. The whys are encouraged by that because it's an opportunity to grow. And, and the, if, if we have pride in ourselves, then that hurts our pride, right? That someone's corrected us or we didn't do something perfect. But if, if we're humble, 
If, we're, if, it's, if this isn't about pride, this isn't about us looking good. If we're humble, then that's an awesome opportunity for us to uh, see ourselves from a different perspective and be able to learn and grow. Now, to receive any of this wisdom that we've talked about throughout this chapter, we must first humble ourselves. This wisdom is teaching us how to fear the Lord and how to live by that fear of the Lord. And we take great care as we learn to wisely relate to others and as we learn to really value how other people relate to us. This, this comes up from time to time. Uh, when I'm talking with people in the church, just, you know, after service or whatever, but, uh, people will come up to me and be like, ah, I don't want to, I don't want to talk to people because I, I'm, I'm an introvert. And I always tell them I'm an introvert too. And they're like, no, Weston, you couldn't be an introvert. And I'm like, no, really, I'm a real introvert, like a real big introvert. Now why God would call an introvert to be in a people ministry? I don't know. Ask him. But, but he did. And this principle has really helped me in ministry because I, I love people and I like, I care for people. It's just, it kind of exhausts me. Like it just makes me tired. And so like, you know, I have to like gear up to talk to people. And then on Monday, you know, I'm, I'm all done. <laughs> so, 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 uh, this principle has really helped me personally in ministry. First, I spend a lot of time learning how to relate to other people better. I analyze how I speak to people and how I interact with people. And I think of like, I, I try to grow in my relations to other people. I, I want to communicate well and I want people to feel comfortable talking with me and comfortable interacting with me. And I don't want people to feel like I'm super awkward or something. So I'm constantly learning how to improve in that. Now, second, I also really value how other people relate to me. I learn from my interactions with other people. I learn about the person that I'm speaking with. I get to know that person better and understand how that person works and how they think. I learn wisdom from the person, whether they realize they're giving wisdom or not. Uh, or sometimes they're giving anti-wisdom, like what not to do. But, but I'm learning wisdom from interacting with the person. I receive correction from them. Again, whether they understand that or not, but whether, whether they know they're doing that or not, but I receive uh, feedback from them on how I can change and improve. And I see, like, I learn their perspectives of things and how they uh, see things that are going on. And, and I learn from that. And, and I, I learn how to communicate better with them as they react to my, the weird things I might say or something. Um, or as certain things land with them better, I learn how to fine tune my communication so that I'm clear and so that they feel comfortable. So I'm focused on improving my communication, speaking, in other words, in Proverbs terms, speaking wiser to them. I'm, I'm focused on growing in that. I'm also really appreciating that interaction that I'm having with them as a person getting to know them and then also gaining wisdom and gaining insight from that interaction that I'm having with them. Now, our interactions with each other are so, so important. We should take great care with how we relate to each other. We should have a ton of patience with each other. You know, not letting things get under our skin about other people. We should have, we should be relating to people with a ton of peace. With, we shouldn't be wanting to conflict with them or we shouldn't be wanting them to pay or wanting them to, to feel uh, bad the way we feel bad. We should be wanting peace with them. We should be res relating to them with love, caring more about them than we're caring about ourselves. It doesn't matter, you know, how I'm feeling right now. It, it more matters how they're feeling right now. We should be relating to them with humility. I'm not any better than this person I'm interacting with. In fact, this person is an honored person. This person is someone that I care about. I might not be super close with them, but I care about them and I want to honor them with this interaction that I'm having. 
We should really value our interactions with other people. We should learn about them. We should learn wisdom from them. We should receive correction from them, and we should be encouraged by them. Our interactions with each other are are extremely valuable, extremely valuable for helping us grow in wisdom, and and just intrinsically valuable. That I mean, and and, and this is just in general interactions. But you take it a whole nother level if we're talking about interactions within our church body. Because that's our, our church here is, is, is not just a bunch of neighbors. And neighbors are extremely important in scripture. That we, we're supposed to love our neighbors as ourselves. Neighbors being the other people in society around us. But this is a step beyond that. These are siblings in Christ. Siblings in the kingdom of God. Our brothers and sisters and this is a, a specific, unique, local expression of that. We're truly a family here. Uh, when Jesus talked about the connections of the, of the brothers and sisters in Christ in the Gospels, he talked about those connections as just as important as his blood family, if not more important. When they said, your mother and your brothers are outside, he said, who are my mothers and brothers? The family of God. And this local expression of that is even more real because, uh, you know, we can't be, we physically can't be close with every Christian in the world. We can be close with every Christian in this church. So this really is, I mean, even a step above just the regular thing, but our interactions with, with each other at this church amongst our brothers and sisters here are so vitally important to our own growth and to their growth and us trading this wisdom back and forth with one another. So our chapter here is kind of, it starts and ends with this focus on how we relate to others. The beginning of it being on how we speak to others and the, how, how powerful our words are to others. The end of it being how important and valuable the relationship with others is. And the middle of our chapter is focused on how we relate to God, living out our fear of the Lord, which is a living sacrifice to live out that fear of the Lord, but it's also something that give, brings us back joy. We're sacrificing to the Lord in our fear of the Lord, but we're receiving joy back from him. And as we share this wisdom with others, um, we're, we're giving out wisdom, we're receiving wisdom from each other, and we're, we're blessed by God in both the joy that we get from serving him and the value we get from relating to each other. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning, Lord. You have blessed us with wisdom about how we relate to you and how we relate to each other. You've blessed us with joy that we get from living out our lives as a living sacrifice to you. And you've blessed us with wisdom that we're able to give to others in a powerful way, wisdom we're able to receive from others in a valuable way. We thank you for all of this, Lord. You've truly blessed us. If we keep our eyes bowed and our heads, our heads bowed and our eyes closed this morning, if you've never trusted in Jesus, You've heard a lot this morning about the love that God has for us and about the community that we have of believers, of brothers and sisters here that really care for each other as well. You've heard about the wisdom that God freely gives us. And so if, if, if that at all resonates with you and, and you feel like you would like the love of God, you'd like this relationship that we have with him and you would like to be a part of this family that we have here if you've never trusted in Jesus before given your life to him that your life would become a living sacrifice to God if you would like to trust in Jesus this morning for the first time if you'd like to raise your hand I'd love to pray with you does anybody want to trust in Jesus this morning Those of you who are raising your hands online, let me pray for you. Father, thank you for these who have chosen to 
trust in you, have chosen to dedicate their lives to you, to be a living sacrifice. I pray that they believe in Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection from the grave and believe that by trusting in Jesus, they could have eternal life, forgiveness of their sins, and live forever being adopted into your family, being a part of your kingdom for eternity. I pray that they trust in you this morning, Lord. If we keep our heads bowed and our eyes closed for a second longer, if you've already trusted in Jesus, and the Lord has spoken to you this morning about living out your fear of him in a way that's sacrificial and in a way that brings you back joy, and the Lord has spoken to you about really appreciating the interactions you have with others, speaking wisely to them, giving and receiving wisdom to and from them. The Lord has touched your heart about those topics this morning. If you want to raise your hand, I'd love to pray for you. Amen, 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 amen. Anyone else want to be included in this prayer? Amen. Father, I thank you for the way you've spoken to us this morning, Lord. True wisdom only comes from you. And we've gotten some great wisdom from you this morning. We see how fearing you is a joyful path sacrificing our lives dedicated to you, every part of ourselves to you, avoiding that wicked sacrifice. We see how powerful our words can be to others and how important those relationships with others are and how we can share wisdom. So I pray for these who are raising their hands this morning, Lord, you have spoken to them powerfully and clearly. And I pray that you um, help them continue to receive this wisdom from you. Help help them root that in their souls and, and be able to live that out this week. Live out that living sacrifice and find joy and, and uh, wisdom in their relationships with others as well. For all of us, Lord, you've blessed us already. We thank you for that and we pray for more blessing in the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.